Let me just thank you again for this very kind invitation. I will try to make it compact. So talking, I'd like to talk about the timing for reconstructive uh, uh, open sky trauma. Uh, now we know that We know that the sur uh, a trauma surgeon is a very particular job because we are called to rebuild, uh, to set the clock back, rebuild the eye as it was before the trauma. So this is obviously takes a great number of skills and we define ourselves as pole to pole surgeons, some a skill which has now becoming lost because people specialize in just certain sectors, but we have to tackle with problems that go from the front of the eye, that is the cornea, all the way to the retina. So let me just th go through, this is the BET classification, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with. Uh, this was uh, created by Ferenc Kuhn, and uh, I won't go into the details because I know every, everybody is familiar with this, but we're dealing with open globe injuries today, so essentially laceration and rupture as well as penetrating intraocular foreign body and perforating injuries. Now, there are set, it, this is a multi-step procedure. Um, we start by reconstructing the scleral corneal, uh, the corneal scleral shell. Uh, therefore, we have to suture the cornea, we have to suture the sclera as posteriorly as possible. Sometimes this is not possible and we'd rather leave uh, 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 a scleral a breach rather than uh, damage the eye any further. Uh, sometimes we have to isolate the muscles, we have to reposition uh, prolapsed tissue. Um, the second step is obviously that to preserve the retina. We try to reattach the retina as quickly as possible, as soon as possible. We have to address the choroid because many times we also have a choroidal, uh, a suprachoroidal hemorrhage, uh, so we have to put that flat and we must not forget to address the ciliary body as well because uh, hypotony is always uh, one of the dangers we have in these eyes when ciliary body fibrosis occurs. Um, the s third step is preventing, uh, preventing early complications. These include mostly endophthalmitis and we know that in certain cases we must have early vitrectomy uh, for example, when we have uh, organic foreign bodies present in the eye. And, f and the fourth step, I would say, is that of preventing uh, uh, intermediate complications, those complications which develop a few weeks after the trauma itself, and this is generally associated with either glaucoma, and uh, I've shown you the, the, the valve I've been using for over 20 years to, to, um, to uh, tackle with uh, refractive glaucoma and PVR. Now, there's no magic bullet for PVR, but I believe if we have early and complete vitrectomy and a high dosage uh, of, uh, uh, of steroids, we can probably uh, tilt the scale in our favor. And finally, the fifth, uh, uh, the fifth step is that of improving visual acuity, and this obviously involves anterior segment reconstruction, which may involve a corneal graft, we, have, we may have to revisit the retina, for example, if we have scarring of the retina, uh, and then the all-important lens replacement surgery, which can be a, just a routine FACO, or we may have to implant a cosmetic IOL or an artificial iris. So what are the options for the timing? Now, we can either have a comprehensive approach, which means that we will repair the corneal scleral shell and we'll deal with the, um, we will deal with the retina as well, or we can have a stepped approach, which is better. Um, well, you have, must have a plan. You must assess, inform yourself, evaluate uh, your resources. As far as assessment is concerned, you must assess the patient's general conditions, see if anatomical reconstruction is possible. This involves counseling the patient and which tissues are involved, so what are you likely to find? What sort of situation will you uh, be encountering? And you have to ask yourself, how will time affect my patient? You also have to uh, understand the dynamics that brought you to this particular trauma because these can tell you 
more or less what sort of trauma you'll be dealing with. And then you have to evaluate res your resources. You have to know your limits. Can you deal with the case? Must I ha seek help? Uh, do I have the right staff? Am I in the proper physical and mental conditions to deal with this case at this time? So uh, it would seem wiser to me to carry out the two steps uh, uh, separately. Uh, but the question is, uh, how much time should we leave in between? And conventional wisdom has it that we generally have step one, which is the reconstruction of the outer shell as soon as possible, but then step two is very variable. Many people would like to wait up to 15 days after the trauma has happened. And this is because mostly people like to uh, reduce the risk of a choroidal hemorrhage. They feel that by waiting you can reduce choroidal hemorrhage and you can have an easy removal of the posterior hyloid. Um, the disadvantages, however, I think outweigh the advantages. You have a higher risk of PVR. Uh, you may eventually end up reattaching a non-functional retina. Uh, ciliary body fibrosis, as I said before, uh, you can have a stained cornea, glaucoma, and ophthalmitis. So I think that uh, if you have a, a, a time uh, approach in which you actually have two steps, but the two initial steps are uh, intervened by only a few days, you probably have the best compromise. This is just an example. Unfortunately, for some reason this morning, the video was not running, so this has to be taken out. And I want to show you, um, I want to show you just what uh, a normal uh, trauma which has been dealt with effectively can lead to. So this is a gentleman that had this uh, a perforating injury and the uh, offending foreign body was removed um, uh, the night that he came in. This was at eight o'clock at night. So suturing was carried out as best as possible. And uh, as you can see, uh, the muscles were not uh, disinserted, they were simply uh, uh, shifted to one side, and then um, it was possible to send the patient to bed and carry out the, the, s the successive surgery the following day. And the following day, obviously, we find a vitreous hemorrhage, but we know that we will have a, uh, a retinal incarceration. So by dealing with that early, we can actually uh, have better results. Here we see that the retina is incarcerated in the scleral wound, you need uh, uh, to free it from, from this. Sometimes you have bleeding. You can deal with the bleeding by doing vitrectomy under air. As you can see here, I have a bubble of air and I'm dealing with the, with the, uh, with the diathermy under air. I can then remove the blood clots. I can uh, diathermize uh, the retina uh, and the scleral um, um, uh, breach uh, uh, with a high, uh, with a high um, intensity of, uh, of heat, and, and therefore I can prevent recurrence of fibrovascular growth. And at that point, I have a free retina, as you can see. Uh, I have a, a perfectly closed uh, um, scleral uh, wall, and I can then deal with releasing the tractions of the retina itself and putting the retina back into place and then lasering it, put in silicone oil, and, and you have a patient that actually has a 0.8 vision uh, up to this day, and this is a video which goes back 10 years ago. So uh, I think my time has uh, expired. I just want to make a point because I had a successive video, unfortunately I cannot show it, but if you wait too long, you will, you will then have uh, a blood-stained uh, cornea um, and, and all sorts of problems that you do not want to deal with. Uh, can I have just one extra minute to, uh, to show this case? Um, this is, a, is a, a young boy that actually came to my attention after severe trauma. He was in intensive care for three weeks. Therefore, they could do nothing else but suture and, and, and wait for the boy to survive. Then you know that you're gonna find problems. Here we have a, 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 a blood-stained cornea, as you can see, 
Uh, we certainly have retinal incarceration. You've seen the stitches on the sclera here, so we know we're going to find uh, a funnel of retina uh, incarcerated over there. And by being patient, we simply achieve the liberation, the freeing, as you can see, of the retina itself. With a bit of luck, we can actually get to this point where the retina is visible. I always use viscoelastics to open up the funnel, never use heavy liquids. And I am now removing the blood, which is on one face of the retina. I will then cut the retina here, free the funnel. I go very fast because I don't want to steal anybody's time. But I think this is interesting. Um, you can see the back of the retina. This is actually the choroidal surface of the retina. You can then uh, uh, open up the funnel with scissors. And there we go. We eventually get to this situation in which the funnel has been opened up. And now you can continue your surgery with a keratoprosthesis and free the remaining half of the retina, which is now sitting on the other side uh, with, uh, with a conventional procedure. So now you see that you can actually, uh, you can actually remove what's left of this, uh, of this blood clot around the retina and until you, you get a nice funnel. The important thing, whoever's doing this, do not free the funnel completely, otherwise you won't know how to place it. You get uh, that you, it will not be properly placed on the choroidal plane. And as you can see, we get to the end and you put uh, perfluorocarbon and you laser and it's finished. This is just to show the difference. One was easy surgery, the other one was difficult surgery which probably has, has had very poor visual results. So timing is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jini. Thank you for showing wonderful videos. If there are any questions the delegates want to ask, please. Yeah, you have a question? Go ahead. What sutures do you use for uh, switching the sclera? Six, six or vicryl. Six or vicryl, yeah. Six or vicryl. And the other thing was, there was an old study which looked into trauma in rhesus monkey models, and they said that wait for two weeks because after trauma, you get a PVD after two weeks, and then it's an optimal time to intervene to do a repair of the vitreous or doing vitreous surgery. Do you believe that, or you no? Think? No, actually, the last slide I, I, I didn't have time to show. No, I generally wait the hundred-hour rule. So I, I I firmly believe that you will, if you get complications which are essentially bleeding, you will get complications from bleeding just the same. Because once you have scar tissue forming, that scar tissue is going to be vascularized. So you're going to be dealing with another sort of hemorrhage. Um, I don't think that choroidal hemorrhages, um, we've seen how to drain them. Uh, if we have choroidal hemorrhages, they're there already. They're not going to develop it as a result of surgery. It's simply one of the complications of, of the trauma itself. So I see absolutely no advantage in waiting so long. Uh, if you do have a very uh, inflamed eye, which is difficult to tell in these cases because obviously these eyes are always very much traumatized, then you have to go with a very high uh, uh, steroid regimen for those two or three days, but then you have to go back in. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, everything will be compromised. Least, but, uh, but last but not least, the fact that the retina, as you've seen in this last case, uh, it was a non-functioning retina. This, this boy ended up with light perception, uh, whereas the other gentleman ended up with 0.8 vision. Yeah, because the model actually was shown by 
I think Stephen Bryan and Phil Cleary, the animal model. And that's what was used by my consultant in Ireland at the time I was training there. So he used to say, wait for two weeks to do that one. So yeah. I don't believe, I totally agree with you. Yeah. I, th I don't think but we should wait for two weeks. Yeah, but we've gone it. through a lot of things that sometimes we take as the Bible, but if they are not so. No, the thing is, uh, vitreoretinal surgical techniques have improved so much. I mean, from yeah. what it was at that yeah. time. Yeah. Visualization has improved so much. So I don't think that it makes any purpose in waiting that long. So you agree? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you because waiting for a PVD to occur and allowing a vascularized discard, you have to, uh, you have to weigh the advantages. Uh, yeah. Mere PVD against the possibility of a vascularized discard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Hi, Doc. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Um, I saw that uh, large metal intraocular foreign body removal. Uh, what is the best, uh, be before we do the surgery, what is uh, the best imaging uh, technique uh, you use for those kind of cases? Is it uh, the in these, two, in these two cases? Yes. Well, in, in one case, I, I attempted the, the case I couldn't see through the cornea, uh, uh, ultrasound. And ultrasound, I'm not an ultrasound expert. So to me, it was very confusing. It just looked as I, I couldn't make anything out of it. I imagine an expert would have seen the funnel. I did not see the funnel. I just saw ev everything was very dense. Um, and, and the other, I simply had no reason to do any imaging because the foreign body was actually out there. In general, when you get intraocular foreign bodies, uh, if that's the question, um, you can either see them because because they're generally if they're small, they're sitting on the retina or hiding somewhere. Then you have a, a other, I, I, I believe the slit lamp is still fundamental, but then you have obviously echography and you can have uh, RMA, um, uh, C CT scans, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Najmun Nahar. Dr. Shobha Shiv Prasad. He is going to talk how can ophthalmologists contribute to tackling the diabetic diabetes epidemics. Smart India study. Kindly introduce yourself also. Um, yes, I am um, Shobha Shiv Prasad. I am a consultant in Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. That side, is it? Okay. Ophthalmologist in tackling diabetes. Are you hearing me? So I think all of us are very aware of the uh, global diabetic epidemic. All of us are very familiar with this mass as well. So the question is, what do we do for this? As an ophthalmologist, of course, we have got our own ways of tackling this. But we should also remember we are doctors. And as doctors, I think we should tackle diabetes in addition to diabetic retinopathy. So the Indian diabetic epidemic is even worse when compared to the rest of the world because the prevalence of diabetes is uh, yet to increase several times fold compared to Western countries. In the UK, with we have only a prevalence of about 4%, but the uh, prediction is that the NHS will go bankrupt within the next few years due to the cost of the complications of diabetes. In the UK, 10% uh, of the NHS budget is spent on uh, complications of di uh, on diabetes and its medications, out of which 80% is spent on complications to deal with the complications of diabetes. So it's a very big hazard all throughout the world. So how can we contribute is the first question. We can contribute by just dealing with diabetic retinopathy. As you all know, a third of patients will have diabetic retinopathy, but only 10% will have sight-threatening disease, and that's the group we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. 
We can tell these patients when they come in that they have to control their blood sugar because we know from the UK PDS that both hypertension and diabetes um, should be optimally controlled to decrease the rate of progression of the disease. We are not very good as, at advising them to control their lipid levels, although we have recent trials on the field study and the court study that show that uh, phenofibrate may help in reducing the risk of progression of retinopathy, but even the general practitioners do not prescribe this as yet. So this is all what we are doing today. What we are thinking of is can ophthalmologists go one step further? And as you know, Diabetes does not only affect the eye, it affects many organs in the body, as you can see from this figure. And we as retinal specialists or as ophthalmologists should also be aware that if a patient has proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it's an important predictor of nephropathy. It's also a predictor of cardiovascular disease and death, and probably a diabetic feat as well. And if a patient has diabetic macular edema, these patients are two risk of developing, twice as much risk of developing stroke or myocardial infarction. So can we advise these patients to also see a general physician or um, their respective specialist uh, physician? As part of an Ornate India project, which is done between the UK and India, we have a study called the Smart India Study where we as ophthalmologists are leading this pathway to see whether we can holistically screen a patient for diabetes as well as its complications. So we are, we are ophthalmologists, but we are going to go around 20 centers in India looking at urban, semi-urban and rural areas to do house-to-house -house visits and diagnose patients with diabetes if they have not been di uh, diagnosed as yet look up, do a urine test for them so that we can check their nephropathy for them. Very simple test of blood pressure, which will check, which will uh, allow us to refer them on to a physician. And of course, our uh, non midriatic photographs for diabetic retinopathy. So as an ophthalmologist, we are able to do this very simple test as well. So this is our approach. So we will do a retino uh, diabetic retinopathy screen, a urine albumin, and uh, a cardiolipid check for the rest of the complications. What are we expecting? We are expecting a few patients to be diagnosed with diabetes for the first time, diagnosed with hypertension for the first time. We will newly detect retinopathy. We can also then in, in understand that the patients have microalbuminuria and refer to their respective physicians. So you can see how as an ophthalmologist, we can also look after their general health and ask them to go to their physicians in time. And in, if we are able to do this type of holistic screening, probably we can also reduce the rate of mortality in these patients. We may think that is a study, but within the Kerala government, we were also able to incorporate a diabetic screening pathway into their national uh, in non-communicable disease strategy. Mm -hmm. In that, we are insisting on an urine albumin test and a foot examination as well. So we are dealing with all microvascular complications, although it is led by ophthalmologists. So in addition to just detecting other complications, we are also very hungry for data, for high quality data to come out of India. We need to know the relative prevalence of diabetes complications, stratify risk according to their um, risk of complication. We have to get data to inform the government about changes required to ensure a whole body screening for people with diabetes to ensure scalability and sustainability of such program. We also have an opportunity to do educate patients and hopefully it will produce a global impact in all other countries where the primary infrastructure is not good enough for patients to have their diabetes or their microalbuminuria diagnosed. So the question is, should ophthalmologists lead the way? Because diabetic retinopathy is the most common complication of diabetes and the fact that it needs technical expertise, despite the fact that we have artificial intelligence, I think we can only add two more tests. We seem to see more patients with complications than any other specialty, so we should lead the way. End of the day, we can only lead the way. Patients still has to attend several multidisciplinary team uh, as well to get themselves sorted, but we can start the process for them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So any questions? I think it's a great initiative and uh, 
if I can say, probably the, the, the least spoken about complication of diabetes in a general medical clinic uh, is diabetic retinopathy. Uh, most diabetics, I think, are educated, or at least uh, physicians once in a while check for renal function. And, uh, but when it comes to telling the patient to check the retina, I think it's still, at least in our country, uh, at least in the semi-urban and rural areas, I think, unfortunately, it's very poor. And even in very educated uh, societies and educated uh, high liter literacy states, we come across patients with uh, end-stage retinopathy for the first time to a clinic. Yeah. And uh, the first thing the patient says is, if I only knew the eye was getting affected, I would have been checking much earlier. So this probably is a story in many, many countries, even in many developed countries. I mean, I'm not saying that. Uh, yeah, diabetic so retinopathy screening is very So limited. from that point of view, I think uh, the ophthalmologist taking the lead to diagnose or detect nephropathy, which we have done in our clinic very often, where we have first shown patients that they have microalbuminuria when uh, someone else should have been doing that. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. So we move to the next talk by Dr. Raman. S. V. Raman on uh, steroid implants, and Doctor, you, you can also please introduce yourself. I'm leading today. No, I'm leading now. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, and thanks to the All India Optimal Society for giving me this opportunity to present my topic here today. I have no financial disclosures uh, relevant to this topic. Um, I want to present initially a first case report, uh, which has relevance to the topic I'm going to present. An eight-year-old female was bilaterally pseudophagic with uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus of 20 years duration, presented with a history of diabetic macular edema of two years. Of significant significance was she had lots of comorbidities like coronary artery disease to name some few, a heart valve replacement with uh, coronary artery bypass graft and also a history of uh, mini stroke in the past. So we did an OCT scan and the OCT scan showed uh, central retinal thickness was greater than 400. So she was eligible for treatment with an anti vegf agent because in England, uh, the National Health Service, people are eligible for treatment only if their central retinal thickness is greater than 400. But uh, she had the first injection. After that, she was lost for follow-up due to intercurrent illness. And then she was reviewed after six months and scheduled to have a second course of anti vegf agent. But in the interim, she again developed some uh, systemic problems like ischemic heart disease. She presented 18 months later after the initial episode on a wheelchair. So she first walked in initially, and then she later presented on a wheelchair, uh, strapped securely with an indwelling catheter. So at that stage, I decided the best option in her case would be to treat her with an intravitreal glucinol acetonide implant. She had that, and the response was very spectacular. And uh, within a couple of months, a uh, macula been dry, and then in the last 16 months, 24 months follow-up, she still maintains a dry macula. The two big societal burdens of treating a retinal disease, and we're grappling with this problem, is of treating wet age-rated macular degeneration and diabetic maculopathy, along with the small component of vascular disease like uh, vein occlusion. The patient profile is quite different. That's important to understand. Patients with age-rated macular degeneration, it's basically a local disease as compared to patients who have diabetes. It's a multi-system disorder. So patients come to hospital for various reasons. If they're diabetic, they have to meet the endocrinologist. If they have poor sugar control, they have to see the diabetic uh, nurse practitioner in primary care in England, of course. They may have to see the cardiologist and come on alternate days for uh, renal dialysis if they've got renal failure. And the least we can do is to subject them to further visits uh, as a retinologist to have more anti vegf injections. So why this holistic approach for treating DMO? I think it's a multi-system involvement. It's not just an eye disease, it's a systemic disease. The care has to be individualized to the particular patient, and the best we can do is to reduce the burden of these patients visiting hospital. 
what are the treatment options we have at the moment? Well, we have a conservative treatment. Not everyone needs treatment. Then you have thermal laser, you have anti vegf and you have the stirred implants. But unfortunately, the anti vegf has taken a center stage at the cost of steroid implants. We've got two implants. One is the dexamethasone implant, which works very well. It has to be repeated in about three to four months' time. And then you have the flucinolone acetonide implant, which stays in the eye for roughly about three years. But uh, practical terms, after two years, they may need to have a, a topper with the anti vegf or a repeat injection of Illivium. So there's plenty of evidence in the literature uh, showing the efficacy of uh, all the three anti vegf agents, so there's no doubt about it. But what about the visual outcome with the anti vegf agent in real life world? Does it mimic the what we see in uh, RCT? The answer is probably no. There's a paper which came out from North America a few months back which looked into 15,000 patients, and when they looked into the outcome of patients treated with anti vegf they found that the outcome was meaningfully inferior, not superior, inferior to those noted in RCTs. And it didn't really matter what anti vegf agent was being used. So let's go to the conservative management. I mean, patients sometimes come and say they don't want any treatment, they're afraid of lasers, they're afraid of injections. So they just want to be followed up, so they don't want to be discharged. So look at their risk factors like glycated hemoglobin, the blood pressure, the cholesterol, but don't forget anemia. Anemia is an important factor. It can also uh, uh, improve, uh, increase the progression of retinopathy. So in type 1 diabetics, there's a possibility that they can have, uh, being an autoimmune disease, uh, pernicious anemia. And in type 2 diabetes, they can have anemia of chronic disease. So look at anemia and treat it and inform the, uh, the, the physicians if that's needed. Laser lock works very well, and this is a patient who had a center involving CSME, and in spite of that, uh, I treated her because the CRT was less than 400, so she was not eligible for treatment with anti vegf And after two courses of focal laser, she responded very well. Now, the important question is uh, patients cannot come to hospital on every occasion. You have a patient with a cardiac failure with pulmonary hypertension. You can't subject him to treatment uh, with an anti vegf agent with frequent hospital visits. So I switched this patient to a dexamethasone implant and the patient seems to be doing well and uh, the macula has been relatively dry over the years. The important thing is the implant, which is the pilocinone implant, which works fantastically. It's not got much press. People are not looked into it because of many reasons, which I'll come to the next few slides. And this is the patient, if you look at the macula on the left-hand side, it looks like a terminal macula which is gasping. And one would say that patients will not sort of uh, have any improvement with any form of treatment. So I gave uh, a flucinol acetonoid injection and after 12 months, the retina is completely dry and the vision is picked up to about 30 letters, better than what she had when the patient presented with 23 letters. And relatively, the patient has been stable with a fairly stable visual acuity. They can also do a bilateral intervitreal uh, implant, which seems to do very well, and they seem to tolerate this injection well as well. The two factors which has been implicated as a problematic being the cost with steroid implant. But there's an economic model which has been worked out by a group called Coutinho et al., and they looked at the costing of a steroid implant versus anti vegf agent, and it seems that the cost long-term is comparable, so it's not uh, increasing, increasing in terms of the cost when compared with anti vegf agent. So, uh, in fact, I did a paper recently which presented it and looked at the cost analysis comparing three years after the recept uh, versus a switch to uh, fusno acetonide, and at least in the short term, in two years, there has not been any increase in the cost, and the cost is quite comparable with an anti vegf agent. The two factors which is again said that is a problem because you give steroids, one disease being treated and you create another disease like glaucoma and cataract. And in fact, in the FAME trial, when they looked at it, they found that the incidence of uh, cataract is no, much, no different from the general population. And glaucoma, of course, you get that in 20% of patients, but this is quite easily treatable with a single drug in most of the instances, if not a second drug, and about 0.2% or less will need an incisional trabeculectomy. So 
I would say that you should always consider intravitreal trimsinone as a first option in certain group of patients. And as a hindsight, when I look back, I thought my patient probably would have benefited by having an in aluminum implant rather than an antivagic agent. So patients who have multiple comorbidities, who have poor mobility, who are wheelchair bound, patients who can't make frequent visits to hospital due to renal dialysis, they have a mild cognitive defect, or they have transport problem, which is quite relevant, not just in undeveloped countries, but can happen even in developed countries like England. So in conclusion, I would say that don't treat uh, diabetic macular as a disease in isolation. It's not a disease of the eye only. Consider the patient. Don't just focus on the retina. Consider steroid implant in suitable patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vasant Tavan. Uh, we move on to the next. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We move on to the next talk by Dr. Ashish Sharma. Can we ask the next speaker, Dr. Git Gitalisa? Is she here? Yeah, can you make your presentation? Thank you. Then you can upload it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then you need to leave now. You need to leave now. Can we have your talk now? Is it okay? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sir, can we have the next one and then Sir. we'll have this? Okay, so thank you uh, for the organizing committee and it's a pleasure for me to be in indoor in this excellent meeting. So I'm going to talk about uh, my study, phenofibrate treatment in diabetic retinopathy with dyslipidemia, effects on diabetic macular edema. As we all know, a DR is a microvascular complication of diabetes and is one of the main is the main cause of blindness in diabetics. The main risk factors uh, are known to be hyperglycemia, duration of, of diabetes, uh, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. Fission threatening DR or PTDR tre treated is treated with laser, intravitreal anti-FEGF injections, and or vitrectomy, but they are relatively expensive, need for well-trained op ophthalmologists and uh, possible complications. So uh, adjuvant treatments with various agents can contribute 
to the prevention of PTBR, thus reducing the need for costly treatment modalities. Phenofibrate, a peroxisome proliferator activated, activated receptor alpha or PPAR alpha agonist from fibroclast al is also used to control blood lipid. And previous studies show the additional benefit of preventing, uh, of the effect of phenofibrate in preventing DR progression, unlike its uh, counterpart part statin. So we co uh, conducted a study, a prospective double blind uh, randomized uh, clinical trial to evaluate the effect of oral phenofibrate to uh, central macro thickness and macro volume, the two uh, main parameters of DME. So uh, we uh, did a randomization to uh, a group of, uh, we divided the pa patients with uh, met inclusion criteria into intervention group and control group. The intervention group received phenofibrate phenofibrate 200 milligrams and simvastatin 10 milligrams and the uh, control group received placebo instead of phenofibrate and they were follow uh, they would they will uh, they are followed up for three months given treatment for three months and uh, with each monthly each patient having monthly visit and uh, uh, the compliance were checked through a checklist and if uh, their uh, rescue treatment is uh, commenced if the patient shows uh, significant DME or signs of progression to PDR during the study with anti VEGF or laser. So this is the research flow. So at the end, we only included 30 eyes from 15 subjects in both intervention group and control group. So all uh, patients uh, underwent clinical uh, general exam, eye exam, uh, fundus photo and macular spectral domain OCT, and also were checked for laboratory uh, for urine and blood tests for uh, blood glucose control, uh, lipid, uh, the, the classical lipid parameters, and also uh, monitoring for uh, kidney function and liver function. And the photo were uh, read by two independent uh, VR consultants with good, uh, a good agreement. So these are the results. Uh, we see that the demographic uh, between the two groups, the demographic and clinical uh, characteristic were similar. Most eyes were uh, categorized as moderate and PDR, and uh, similar numbers of uh, proportion of patients with DME, and also all the patients, uh, most of the patients are phagic. And we see here the uh, blood um, par parameters, parameters, the blood control, the cholesterol uh, lip, uh, profile lipid between the two groups were also similar, but as you see, after treatment in the phenofibrate group, there's a significant uh, decrease in uh, cholesterol levels and also LDL cholesterol level. So, um, yeah, this is the outcome in central macro thickness. We see that between the two groups, there's uh, in the end, at the end of the study, there's no significant difference. There is a significant uh, different, uh, lower uh, central macro thickness in the phenofibrate group. And I think this is in line with the previous uh, study on phenofibrate, which is the Macufan study. And this is the clinical, uh, sorry, the outcome from macular volume. We can see here that there's also no difference between uh, the macular, thic macular volume in the two groups. And we did a subgroup uh, analysis in patients with DME. We wanted to know uh, what it is, is the difference of the uh, profiles of uh, DME patients compared to the overall, uh, to the other non, uh, the patients without DME. We can see that the uh, patients with DME have a longer duration of diabetes and also a low, significantly lower H level of HDL cholesterol. And uh, after treatment, uh, we observed that in the uh, group treated with phenofibrate, there is a uh, uh, significantly lower uh, central macro thickness uh, compared to baseline, whereas in the group which received placebo, there is uh, an increase in the central macro thickness until month two, followed by a, a decrease, but still above the baseline uh, central macro thickness. And in uh, terms of the macular volume, uh, we can observe until the second month, uh, because uh, the third month had a, um, the distribution was uh, uneven. So we, we see that there's a constant uh, um, lowering of the uh, decrease of the macular volume, whereas in the control group, there is a, a slight decrease of macular volume. 
And this is just to show you, I think, the, um, the course of funders' photo uh, appearance and also OTT. This is in the intervention group. You can see that they're stable without uh, any uh, treatment with anti pedf or laser. There's a relatively uh, stable uh, macular uh, retinal appearance. And also the OTT, although there's a slight um, progression in the second uh, and the first month, is followed by st stabilization. And even the central macular thickness is slightly lower compared to baseline. And this is another example. This is in the control group. This patient only received uh, simfastatin. Also, no intervention yet. You can see stabilization of the uh, uh, macular edema here. Yeah, there's still some remaining intra-retinal uh, fluid in the uh, end. So I think uh, the phenol fibrate has been um, proposed as an alternative treatment to uh, prevent progression of VR, but uh, still we uh, we don't know exactly how uh, the mechanism, uh, how it works, uh, phenol fibrate in, in preventing prevention. One would propose uh, its uh, mechanism related to lipid, which is lowering the TG, uh, lowering uh, total cholesterol and LDL, and also uh, elevating apple A1 and also HDL cholesterol, and also reducing apple B. And also, it may be a uh, phenol favorite is also believed to have non lipid mechanisms such as antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects by uh, reducing IL-6, also TNF-alpha, uh, induced uh, VCAM expression and also C-reactive protein. Also, it has an anti-apoptotic and anti-angiogenic an effect by activating AMP kinase and reducing PEGF and increasing PDF levels and also preventing endothelial discussion. So this is, um, so I think uh, still we, although we, we think that uh, the limitation of, of our study is the so small sample size, single center study and short follow-up. We have the, um, I th in my opinion, the strength, we evaluated the effect of phenol fibrate in combination with simfastatin before applying, uh, applying any uh, laser or anti pgf treatment. So in conclusion, phenol fibrate treatment for three months, although it did not have an effect, significant effect on CMT and macular volume on overall VR cases, is indicated to have uh, a positive e effect in reducing CMT in VR patients with DME and having a uh, additional positive ex effect as well in decreasing uh, LDL cholesterol and total cholesterol in patients. So can be considered as adjuvant, adjuvant therapy mainly for DME, uh, DME patients with uncontrolled lipid level. And other factors may play more important roles such as systemic factors like blood glucose control and hypertension. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I missed your presentation. Just wanted to ask a question from you. I'm not sure whether you have covered that or not. I uh, just wanted to comment on uh, starting uh, these phenofibrate and simvastatin in a patient who has a normal lipids, but you do see a lot of exudates in the macula. Yes, actually, um, yeah, due to probably ethical reasons, we cannot uh, give final fibrates to uh, patients without uh, any evidence of abnormal blood lipids. So we did it all in this lipidemic patients. And usually the, the diabetic patients, I mean, a lot of them have also uh, abnormal blood lip lipids. Okay. Dr. Raman, do you have any comment? In the case yeah. that you showed there, I mean, the actually there was no significant decrease in the heart exudates, but then the period of follow-up is very short. It's only three months. Usually it takes about six to, how long do you give it, I mean, I suppose? Three months. Three months of uh, phenofibrate. Your controlled patients also had diabetic macular edema? Yeah. No, not all. It's very difficult to come to any conclusion. That's why I didn't ask any questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the inconvenience uh, in the last uh, technical glitch. So, ladies and gentlemen, whosoever is present here. So, I will be talking about the uh, next wave of the drugs, which we call as the biosimilars. Actually, biosimilars, we call it, uh, there are different, different names similar biologic, biosimilars. So they would be there after a few years. So we need to know that what kind of effect and what kind of change that we could see in the, over the time in the next few years. These are my disclosures. 
So if you see, as of now, since the last 10 years, probably, we have been using Lucentis, Ilia, and Avastin as the major drugs that we have been using to treat these patients. And next, next few years, they are all reaching to their patent expiry in both US and Europe. So once these uh, drugs, they reach to their patent expiry, probably the next wave of the drugs that would come into the major role play, those would be the biosimilar molecules. As of now, if you look at the ranibizumab, you have the only molecule which is uh, there as a biosimilar to ranibizumab, that resumab, and just approved in India only, not anywhere else till now. Probably the molecules which is biosimilar, which is going to enter the US market in the next few years when the Lucentis patent expires, probably that is of FYB201, that because that is in the quite high line in the clinical trials. There are a few other molecules which are there in the low uh, line of the clinical trials, for example, exlutane, PFFA2, CHS3351, SB11. SB11 trials are on even in India also. So even aflibercept have few more years for the patent expiry, but there are molecules, for example, FYB203, ALTL9, CHS2020, M710. I would not discuss bevacizumab biosimilars because it's a wonderful drug already available on a cheaper price, and doctors have gained real good experience in that. So I'm not sure whether biosimilars would change anything here. So uh, just a quick word on what biosimilars exactly are. These are the copies, not exact the direct copies, but they should show that they are quite similar in terms of pharmacokinetics, dynamics, immunogenicity, safety, and efficacy. So to, to give them a name that they are really similar. How do uh, they are different from the generic drugs? So that we all need to understand because the market is still is maturing. Generic drugs are chemical formulas. You can make them easily. For example, paracetamol, you can get 10 brands of paracetamol anywhere made, while the biosimilars, they are all monoclonal antibodies. They are made in the living cells. They are tend, they are fragile. They are tend to lose stability. So, uh, so they are quite different. Now the question is how difficult is to manufacture these biosimilar drugs? So the question is innovative molecules, even their patent expires, they do not reveal the entire process that they went through. So actually they need to follow the reverse engineering. They ha have to have the molecules, try to text right from the furthest to the original point. There is an up, uh, investment upfront because so everybody cannot do it. So what could be the possible change in future and why that possible change in future you could see? Innovator biologics takes approximately 10 to 15 years for a single molecule. Approximately 1,200 to 2,500 million US dollars for a single molecule to bring into the market. While biosimilar takes eight to 10 years, approximately five to th uh, eight years earlier, and approximately one-tenth of the price you get one molecule. So, so definitely you get a little bit of cheaper drug. So before we analyze that what kind of the changes that you could expect in the global market after a few years, you just need to see what kind of trend that we are following at this point of time. So if you see the global trend ASRS survey data in US, wet AMD patients were treated predominantly with Avastin, CRVO, BRVO, all these patients predominantly they were being treated with Avastin followed by the Lucentis and Ilia share was much, much less. Look at the share of Avastin, 70%. And the other drugs, 8% and 10%. Just flip it. Flip it to this country. Now look at the data of the VRSI. I do not have the data from the VRSI in 2018, but this is the data in May 2017. What it says is 47% is Avastin. And equal weightage is Lucentis. And that was the time when uh, Biosimilar came in. It already captured approximately 5% of the market. Why is that difference? Because in US, you see the Avastin big, big use because they have a compounding pharmacies well in place everywhere which you do not have in this country and people have burned their hands, they have, they don't want to get into the lawsuits. So the Avastin share could get drifted to the, any molecule, so any similar biology which comes in with a single vial. Lucentis share, why the Lucentis share is too much in this country? Because the pricing is differential. If you look at in the US, the pricing of the one Lucentis vial is approximately $2,000, which is 138 in this country. That is the reason that you see this kind of distribution. So now if you look at the first biosimilar that was launched in 2015, after initial hiccup, you had a lot of reactions coming in between a few of batches. After that company, you know, identified, you know, a few of the 
constituents and then they did a uh, few corrections, then you see the kind of usage. Whatever the, their sales was in 2015, 16, 17, all together, that is much more in the last year. So there is a need for an alternative. So that's why the tech, it was taken up quite well until unless in the last month that we see there are some ADRs who are reported from a particular batch. But overall, if you see from 2016 to 18, if you see the ADR percentage is approximately 0.012%. And this is the paper which was recently published by the Dugal and the group uh, in terms of the end of thalamitis rates in patients who have received the anti vegf injections. Just look at this data. With aflibercept, 0.1. With the bevacizumab, 0.05 and with the Renibuzumab, 0 0.04. So overall, if you see, the ADRs were not high. But the problem was, with one batch, ADR number was high. So company really need to look at that, that why is that intra-batch variability? So if you correct that, I think probably then uh, they can again gain the market. So as I said, you know what, how the things would change. Developed world, things would change in a way, not just because of the drug, because all the US try to uh, save the cost because they are spending a lot of money on the insurance. I'm sure in UK also the same thing. So they, you know, because of the policy, they would like to have these biosimilars in their armamentum rather than the drugs like Lucentis. In developing world, it's a completely different equation. For example, you had a lot of alerts for Avastin, so people would like to definitely see the options which have a single vial. Now the question comes in, okay, once these molecules, biosimilar molecules, enters into the market real on your table, how would innovative companies protect their market share? They have few options. For example, if they, if they work parallelly on the different kind of research, for example, Genentech is working on the uh, RPDS. If they are quite successful in bringing this, they can definitely gain the market again. And there are other ways you can extend the claim, uh, claim extensions of the patent. For example, IDEA did that with few of their uh, claims they have extended from 2021 to 2030. They can file some patent infringement suits and they can hire highlight the minor differences. If you just look at this paper, which was published uh, by the Novartis head office uh, from Basel in 2017, if you just look at the uh, title, Identification of Multiple Serine to Asparagine Sequence Variation Sites in an Intended Copy Product of Lucentis by Mass Spectroscopy. By just looking at the title, you would see that you know, there is a huge variation in the product uh, of the biosimilar that they are comparing with. So. Uh, while if you look at the if you look at the result and the discussion, so the final is relative potency was determined in two Renibuzumab batch. Potency assay, assay analyzing binding to VEGF showed 96 to 97 percent relative binding capacity, similar to Lucentis reference standard, and the potency revealed 99 to 100 percent relative potency compared to Lucentis. So essentially, they were similar. So they can highlight the minor differences. So I would just leave you with a term called bio better. BioBetter is a term given by Lupin uh, Head from India, which has been accepted throughout the globe because all these innovative companies, they had a manufacturing 10 to 15 years before with the older machinery. While the newer drugs, biosimilars, they are 10 to 15 years further. So there's definitely change in the technology. There's a probability that you might see a positive and a better response, but they cannot market it as a BioBetter because uh, they have to go through the everything again. So to conclude, there's a possibility of big sh shift, but all depends how biosimilars are priced and how they control the batch variations and how innovative companies, they plan their strategy. Thank you. Thank you. We come to the end of the session. I think we need to add one more to that. We need to make biosimilars safe also, because uh, that's again a big challenge. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Ramana.